Engage. Perfect. Just like Patrick Stewart. Even if you could go Star Trek speed, warp speed, we would not be able to explore the vastness of the cosmos just because of how big space really is. So if you look at something like a warp speed chart from ye here oldie Star Trek Voyager technical manual, you see they outline exactly what warp speed is. Warp speed meaning that they warp space and time around something like the Enterprise instead of just traveling over space time such that they can go faster than the speed of light. And if you go all the way down to the bottom of this chart, you see that even at warp 9.9999, you can go 200,000 times the speed of light, which is ridiculous. But even with that speed, the time it would take you to get to the next galaxy outside of our own, say Andromeda, would still be 10 years. It would feasibly take many human lifetimes just to explore a few galaxies outside of our own. And so even with sci-fi technology, there just will be some places that we will never boldly go. Why doesn't just the shirt fit? Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections and I address them at warp speed. Not really. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, it's a video about a very specific scientific paper that tried to figure out whether or not a very specific scientific test would accidentally blow up the entire planet. But getting right into it, on the last episode of Because Science, we went back to Chernobyl. This time we were looking at 30 years worth of scientific research into what actually happened to the flora and fauna after the world's worst accidental nuclear disaster. You can watch the full video on the Because Science channel if you want to know exactly what conclusions we came to or not, but basically what I had to say was that even with a nuclear meltdown, Chernobyl and the surrounding areas weren't turned into a nuclear wasteland. Nature, it appears, is much more resilient than that. But what did you have to say? I got my marker Wahlbergs here ready to go. I like how I said it. So it's all comments this week because we were talking about things that actually happened, no corrections, uh, thankfully. And our first one comes from Victor Legendre, who says, hey Kyle, love the show. Super thumbs up. Who says, an animal growing another head or something in that fashion is of course extremely unlikely. But I was wondering if there was even the slightest chance that it could happen. Yes, more often than you may think, animals can be born with two heads. I've seen two-headed snakes, two-headed turtles. The thing to remember when comparing these kinds of mutations to what happened at Chernobyl and the kinds of mutations radiation caused there is that there is a background rate of these kind of mutations happening. So even though, like you said, it is rare, it does happen. There are two-headed animals born. But you'd want to compare that to the background rate of things happening. If this event is, say, one in a million, in Chernobyl, is it one in ten? Is it one out of every three? We did not see any effects like that. Seriously deformed animals over a long period of time. These mutations are not as pop culture presents them. In any case, if there was actually a seriously deformed animal because of Chernobyl, we probably wouldn't even find it, which is another confounding factor because it would probably just have a very reduced lifespan or get eaten, as is the nature of things. And if you've ever seen online like a two-headed turtle or a two-headed snake, they usually do say that these animals have a significantly reduced lifespan. So, uh, in most cases, the mutations aren't cool and weird and fallout style craziness. They're more tragic. Frequent commenter and super nerd Infinite Asim comments something about the host of River Monsters, Jeremy Wade, that many of you also pointed out. They go on to say when Jeremy actually caught the fish in these cooling ponds next to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, the fish was about half the size that it should have been according to the scientists that were there and had 16 times the level of radiation. Uh, Infinite Asim says, goes to show you that radiation exposure doesn't in fact create incredible hulks, but rather seriously damages the environment and the creatures living in it. And do I even have to say that I love the episode anymore? Huh. Keep it up. Thanks. Interestingly enough, when I started my science communication career, I was a science writer and I wrote an open letter to river monsters because I thought they were portraying some of these fish, these monsters, in a light that makes them more scary than they actually are and it is kind of doing them a disservice, making people afraid of them, especially in light of this Chernobyl episode. And Jeremy Wade, as you can see, actually responded to me. You gotta give credit where credit is due. He completed his email to me by saying, so while the programs do have a theme 
theme of fear, it's a positive message. Instead of hiding from the thing that you fear or trying to destroy it, you work to understand it and through understanding, find that you can live with it. I think Jeremy Wade's a super nerd. Jeremy Wade. I love River Monsters though. I've seen every episode of River Monsters. Matt the Trucker says, hey Kyle, I've been watching you since you had short hair. Jeez. And now because science is a favorite show of my kids, Anthony and Ashton. Hello, Anthony and Ashton. And they came up with this question. What are you writing on? Is it glass? What is this psychic wall of energy that traps color from marker tips? Are you Mr. Mime? Oh, you mean writing in the void like this? Yes, it's a curious little ability I picked up when I was first transferred to the void, but Anthony and Ashton, you sound like pretty smart kids. If you just talk with your dad for a little bit about what you think might actually be going on, I think you can figure it out. I tell you what's definitely going on. You gotta draw with your Marker Wahlbergs. There's three of them, so it's an entourage. Huh. James XL Quest, frequent commenter, says, Hey Kyle, great and informative episode. Thanks. So with all the pop culture reference to what they think radiation does to creatures and organisms, would you say that radiation was the go-to for explaining genetic manipulation before genetic manipulation was as mainstream as it is now? Huh. I think that's a very insightful point, James. I think, yes, when we knew of one thing that was very popular in the public consciousness that could uh, mutate DNA and manipulate it in some kind of way, then science fiction writers and storytellers and artists use this as a storytelling device to put into pop culture as a way to manipulate a DNA like in The Incredible Hulk's case. But if you made The Incredible Hulk today, I do not think they would go with gamma radiation because now we just understand that radiation doesn't really change DNA in the ways that you want. It takes a random sledgehammer to your chromosomes and your DNA and it messes them up. What you would use today with technology that we have as it evolves is some kind of genetic manipulation like genetic engineering or CRISPR or what have you. And I think you find that happening throughout pop culture. So it's a very insightful point. But I will point out that we still do irradiate stuff to get beneficial mutations out of them is a kind of form of a genetic engineering and it's used in crops. So around the time when we were discovering how to crack the atom and make atomic weapons and such, uh, the United States government was trying to find peaceful applications of this kind of technology and one of them they hit upon was using radiation to mutate seeds of plants such that they would give more variation in their offspring and so maybe we could find a weird or a good offspring that has say more crop yield when it grows up. So from 1930 to 2014 more than 3200 mutagenic plant varieties were released into the market. We've been doing this for decades, exposing seeds to radiation with the hopes of getting something incredible out of it. Imagine that! Wyatt Henke Vargas says, this guy reminds me of the Felicity Smoke Girl from the Arrow Show, laughter. What? What are you talking about? So you're saying that this girl just happens to look like me? I don't... I have no idea what you're talking about. What's the plot of that show? Who cares? <laughs> Jedi Spartan 38 says, Top Gear, let's drive through Chernobyl with two cars low on petrol. I also like that Top Gear episode where they're trying to run out of fuel in Chernobyl as kind of just like a challenge. It's fun and you know, that's kind of wasteful with terms of the carbon footprint. But there's an interesting point I wanted to bring up since you brought it up. There is a serious variation if you were to go to Chernobyl and visit it in the radiation levels on the street versus into the wilderness or on the woods of either side of a street. Because of the propensity for radioactive dust and particles to settle on plants and animals and in nooks and crannies of the soil, instead of settling on flat pavement, when you go to Chernobyl, I've heard that they actually advise you to stay on the roads and on the pathways because there's just not as much radiation on them. So in doing this test, the Top Gear fellas were being safer than it looked like they were being, which is interesting. It's interesting. Hammond! Gilson Jr. says, is it just me or was Kyle Thanosing his way into villainy to get away with it? I don't know. But for me, he made the less humans, better environment, no matter the radiation argument, so sounds so much more compelling. By the way, Kyle, if I go missing, you'll have guilty written all over you, or at least ridiculously suspicious. So think twice before sending your guy or calling in an airstrike. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's me. 
No, I put them in the washer before I left. Yes, we have green onions. <laughs> Why would I forget that? How have you been? Really? Two weeks? That's not long enough. They hardly even know each other. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, it's this guy, Gilson. Yeah, he's got a beard in his avatar. We're gonna shave it. We're gonna shave it all off. Drones with scissors. Get back to me when you figure it out. Oh, sorry, I was just... donating to the policeman's ball. Oh, my glasses! Our next comment comes from who says, wait, why is radiation more harmful to humans and mammals than it is to any other kind of organism? Well, like I said in the episode, different kinds of organisms have different levels of radio resistance, and this is a resistance to radioactivity. I mentioned that a complexity factor is at work here. The more things that could go wrong in an organism, the easier it would be to mess it up with radiation, so to speak. So imagine everything that happens in just one of your cells. If you took radiation and blasted a human, there's a high chance that something can go wrong in a, such a complicated system. But if you blasted a single-celled organism with the same amount of radiation, there's not as much that can go wrong, right? So that's kind of at play here, and different organisms organisms just respond differently to radiation. I know that some organisms such as the tardigrade have, or water bear or moss piglet, if you're nasty, they're, they're actually lost on the moon right now, some of them. Anyway, organisms like water bears or tardigrades are very radio resistant, and that's because they have actually DNA repairing proteins that help make them less susceptible to stuff like x-rays. Some organisms happen to have that. We do not really have the same systems in place in our own bodies, although we do have DNA repair mechanisms. But like I said, it's easier to smash up the workings of a clock than it is a sundial. We humans are very complicated things. If you try to mess up a single virus in the same way, you see that not as much could go wrong. And so it does go wrong in us. JD Carrion says, let's storm Chernobyl on October 2nd to find out for ourselves. They can't stop all of us. Ah, the internet. Always trying to find way to decrease your average lifespan. Storm Area 51, eat a Tide Pod, head to Chernobyl, and Instagram it. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I got to give to Leonardo Boccoletti, who says, hey Kyle, love the show. Thanks. It's been two videos now, and with this one specifically, you still have not mentioned the radiotrophic fungi that was discovered around the power plant. So Leonardo goes on to describe very well these fungi that were discovered around the nuclear power plant, but that were kind of thriving in the presence of very high levels of radiation. When the scientists investigated these organisms, they found that they were using the pigment melanin in a similar way that plants use the pigment chlorophyll to generate energy to live. So they were using the gamma radiation as opposed to like visible light radiation like a plant would and transforming that into energy that the organism could use. It's an absolutely fascinating example of how life can adapt to extreme environments. And with organisms like fungi, this can happen very, very quickly. Fungi, bacteria, these replicate themselves very quickly, very often. And so there's more generations that have the chance to evolve some kind of resistance or adaptation. We do not divide our own genetic material very often, like once, twice, three times in our lifetime over decades. Fungi, bacteria, viruses, they can replicate a lot in the same amount of time, so they might evolve something. But they're fascinating organisms, so for bringing it all up, Leonardo, you are indeed a super nerd. I thought it would, I thought that would be cooler. Now, moving right along to this week's episode. This week's episode of Because Science is, can a single nuclear bomb ignite the atmosphere? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are going into the history of the Manhattan Project when they developed the first atomic weapons and looking into actual research where some of the most brilliant minds in physics for a certain amount of time seriously considered the possibility of the world's first nuclear blast accidentally turning the entirety of the Earth's air into fused, exploding death. 
It's a fascinating topic with an actual paper which we go through at length, so stay tuned for that episode. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about Chernobyl's wildlife, and leave me all of your nerd nerdiest and best comments, corrections, questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. And don't, <coughs> sorry, I'm a bit under the weather. But isn't everyone always like under the weather? No one's above the weather. I guess the astronauts are on the IS. <coughs> <coughs>